Guten Tag, meine Damen und Herren. Ich begrüße Sie zu unserem Talk auf der Neuseeland-Bühne. Ich, wir bieten Ihnen heute vier Köche aus Neuseeland. Eine, drei Köche, eine Köchin. Ähm, die Idee ist, dass jeder etwas erzählen kann über das, was er macht, über sein Konzept äh, beim Kochen, wo er, wir die letzten Jahre verbracht hat. Und äh, ich glaube, ich kann für alle sagen, dass in den letzten Jahren sich dort irgendwas verändert hat, maßgeblich. Was wir hier heute nicht bekommen, ist ein Überblick über die Küche Neuseelands, weil das wäre ungefähr, als würden wir über die Küche Europas sprechen. Und das Zweite ist, ich muss jetzt gleich in Englisch umschalten, da natürlich wir da keine Sprachbarriere haben, aber es ist einfacher, wenn wir in Englisch kommunizieren. Wenn irgendwas zu erklären ist, dann werde ich vielleicht zwischendrin nochmal auf Deutsch umschalten, aber ich denke, das verstehen alle Englisch, oder? Wir können das in Englisch machen. Keine Proteste, das ist gut. Okay, I switch over to English. Um, first of all, I want to uh, introduce the four chefs uh, and to give an idea on what they are working or what their speciality is. Because, um, first of all, there is no New Zealand cuisine. You cannot say there is a certain dish or a certain kind of preparation and this is New Zealand food. New Zealand is a multinational, multi-ethnic country, and so is the so looks the kitchen of New Zealand. Next to me sits uh, most famous Annabel Langbein from New Zealand. <laughs> Annabel has written a lot of books. A 19, 19 cookbooks. Um, she, you started in New Zealand, as far as I remember, went somewhere to, to uh, the United States. Uh, experienced there, got to know a lot of people in the cooking scene. You are, were not that into this cooking thing, but you collected everywhere you have been a little bit. And uh, your focus, your latest book of the latest one which uh, was published in German uh, Natürlich Kochen uh, the original title of the book is Free Range Cooking and this is the the idea Annabelle is uh, famous about it's free range cooking it's uh, going out to the fields you have a large large beautiful garden where you grow your own things and you do a lot of TV shows there is another one starting next year um, and one of your books, this one, is uh, uh, published, uh, it has over two million copies are sold. And, um, well, we wait for, the, but it's not your latest book as far as I know. There's um, this is the first book to be released in Germany with Graf and Onza, And there is a television series which goes with this book, which has been on television here in Germany. Okay. And then we have just finished making a new television series and just last week, two weeks ago, released a new book in New Zealand to go with that TV show, which will be here next year. Sorry, next year. Okay, great. So, next to Annabelle sits Robert Oliver. He hasn't released uh, 19 uh, books. This is the first one, but it's very thick. And it, um, it, it it has no German copy yet. We try to uh, organize there something, but it's completely different to Annabelle's book. Annabelle's book is living on a farm, cooking there what Mother Nature gave you. The same idea is uh, with uh, Robert's book, but the idea behind is completely different because it doesn't focus on New Zealand cuisine but on the, the kitchen of the whole Pacific, as far as I uh, read in this book. Yeah. What was the idea behind? Um, the, it covers six countries in the Pacific Islands. I, I want to say that though it is a part of New Zealand, because we have a very large Pacific Island community in New Zealand, um, the, and that's part of the dimensionality of New Zealand. Um, but this focuses on, on six islands in the Pacific. The idea behind it was, was that their food had never been the treasure had never been raised, so to speak. And I saw that that had affected their national economy. Tourism is a big economy. Their food wasn't on the menu. The farmers lost out. You know, if the, if the 
native cuisine is on the menu, it's native supply, local supply. So there was a kind of a large negative impact on the island economies. And that was one reason I wrote the book, but it was really just about seeing what was happening in the Pacific. So um, the, the idea was, or what was necessary, is to travel all these countries, stay there, go to the kitchen, go in the, to the yeah. people. Yeah, I mean, it's not a chef book, so to speak. It's, it's not about me at all. It's a, it's a journey through the islands of the, of the Pacific, through the markets, through the farming systems, into the kitchens, um, the old traditional recipes that are often being lost, um, home cooks. So it's a, a, a really a portrait of the Pacific Islands through food. Okay, next to you, it's uh, Peter Gordon. Peter Gordon is traveling a lot. Your half-life is traveling between the places you are engaged. Uh, I know New York, London, and Auckland, and you are... And uh, Istanbul. Istanbul. Actually, yeah. New York, not so much, but Istanbul, there are two restaurants were involved in there. Okay. Yeah. Um, you have in all these places restaurants with different focus? Uh, yeah, but there's a common thread that runs through them, which is flavors from around the world. So um, the, la the last book I did was called Fusion, and it was a, in a way it was an essay on f food and the travel of food and how all ingredients previously came from somewhere else. And even food that we think of as regional food, uh, say if you're, I can't speak so much for the Germans, but if you're in Italy and you think that tomatoes and polenta are classic Italian ingredients, they're actually both from the New World. So with, without travel and movement and refrigeration and many other things, uh, the cuisines we know today wouldn't exist. Whereas um, this book is really just about stuff you can buy locally, I, I suppose in a similar way to Annabelle's book and so far as the relatively easy recipes but there's a there's a few sort of foreign ingredients in there okay thank you and fi finally there is Al Brown he's known as the crazy fire guy because uh, when I got first to uh, if the first time I talked to somebody is uh, what what's he doing what's uh, what's he famous for what is in in what's he in They say, well, he, he just prepares food on open fire. How did that come? I, I, I do actually use other forms of fuel um, as well. Um, but uh, I, I guess uh, I actually the, the book that I wrote before Stoked was a, a book called Go Fish. So it was, it was mainly looking at the New Zealand coast and telling the stories around that and, and obviously fish recipes. And then I wanted to, I guess after that, it was natural that I, I sort of concentrated on um, I guess more on meat cookery uh, and for me uh, I guess a lot of what I do is um, I, I love the I love the outdoors um, and I love I love the challenge of lighting a fire I love the uh, challenge of cooking on a fire there's no heat temperature gauges or anything you're actually really cooking um, I'd never cook anything in a plastic bag I've never sous vide anything in my life um, I like I like the flavors and I like the risk that's involved in cooking on fires but um, so that was sort of, I guess, how, how Stoke came to be. It was uh, an opportunity to look at uh, not, not just uh, lighting a fire myself, but looking over at, at how um, other, um, other cuisines and how the cultures use fire as well, whether it be Maori hangi or it be um, the Chinese cooking large um, or cooking whole pigs in, in pipes or Indian tandoori with charcoal, etc. So... Uh, the more I delved into it, the more I uh, just got very stimulated by it, and and um, yeah, um, it's just something that I really treasure. I like the slowing down. I like the um, I like the taking time. Um, and when you light a fire, it does take a bit of time. And I like the way that you you have to tend it and you have to look after it. And uh, the results from cooking over a fire speak for themselves. Okay, when I got through the book first time, I saw a lot of of pictures of hunting. You show how all this is done and, and explain different meat thing. Are you a butcher? Am I a butcher? Uh, a lot of people might say I'm a butcher. Um, uh, but um, no, I, I mean, obviously, the, the thing about New Zealand is that uh, we are very, very uh, close and connected to the food source. And, um, and that's one of the gr wonderful things about the country. And... Um, 
for me, and I think I speak for everyone here, we love the great outdoors and, and to be able to um, to go and, and walk a beach and collect shellfish for dinner or to be able to um, to hunt in the hills or to collect mushrooms or cut watercress from a stream is something that um, is pretty close to our hearts and it's something that I think as New Zealand we should be hanging our hats on and saying that we, you know, we are very, very close to the source of everything that we cook. Annabel, you told us yesterday on a cooking show about your experience with uh, uh, venison, I think. This is a nice story. How, how did you manage that? You went to, uh, you, you left home, I think, at the age of 16, a few years ago, and then you went to the ni United States. I like that, a few years ago. <laughs> Just a few years ago. <laughs> and then it was something, uh, something um, to, to quit with everything you knew, and you said, I want to do something by my own. I want to be... I don't like the, 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 well, I don't want to put it, I like the risk, but you, you said, I have to be free. I have to do something different. And then you went to the United States, I think. Was yeah. Well, I, I was one of those teenagers that every parent really dreads the idea of having because <laughs> anything my parents suggested that might be useful for me to do, I wanted to do the opposite. So I left home when I was 16 and went to live um, with my boyfriend in a, small community as a, a hippie, really. I grew an acre of vegetables. I never wore a dress for two years. I carried Mao's little red book round with me. I was a real communist. And, um, and from there, I was just, I loved, like Al, that whole visceral sense of the outdoors. My mother knew I was a cook before I did, and she'd given me Julia Child's Mastering the Art of French Cookery. And for a while, I made a living doing live deer recovery. So my job was to jump out. That was the jumper. I'd jump out of the helicopter, which was, you know, careening around the sky, chasing deer. The shooter would dart the deer. And once they were tranquilized, I had to jump out, put the net around them, <clears throat> excuse me, and then hope like hell that the chopper was going to come back and find me because it was going off to shoot another deer. And I made a living doing this. I lived in the bush for about two and a half years. And... All the time when I was coming out of the bush, I would come out with my haunch of venison and I, I used to make my own lobster pots and I'd come out with my lobster. And then I would have Julia Childs mastering the art of French cookery and I'd be making the lobster thermidor, which I think is on page 237 and has a five-point font and goes on for five pages and has more calories than you need for a whole week. <laughs> But um, I think that that freedom that I had of discovering food. I'm not a, a chef, I'm a cook, I'm not trained in any way, but um, I did study horticulture and that really has given me the most brilliant link to understanding the way things grow and when you know that a leek comes from the same family as garlic and shallots and onions, it, you know when you cook it that it will behave in a certain way and it will sweeten in different ways. And so therefore when you're cooking you can substitute and be a lot more flexible. And I think that one of the things that, that I think we all share in New Zealand is this very close connection to freshness. And we're so lucky, um, really, that we've got this global pantry at our fingertips. And that's the thing that, for me, drives everyday cooking into something that becomes really fun. Because you can take that piece of really fresh fish or you know, lovely piece of meat, and you can put salsa verde on top of it, or you can put Thai sweet chili sauce on top of it, or you can put sumac on top of it, and you can take it in all these different directions without really having to have a lot of skill. You just, there's a, one thing you need to know is how to cook that piece of fish. Mm. Thank you. Um, Robert, you traveled all the, all the Pacific Ocean, collected um, uh, a lot of... Uh, a lot of different recipes in your book. I don't have the um, idea, or you don't have, uh, you don't get the feeling that it is um, that uh, it has the order. It's uh, first course, second course, dessert, because there are um, dishes which mixes, which mix where things are or ingredients are mixed, which don't go together in our European idea of uh, of uh, cooking. Um, Do you think here in Europe or somewhere, if you are not uh, in the resident in the Pacific, um, is it possible to get these things? Is yeah. this is there is 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 it? Um, it's of course uh, worth having this book, but uh, it is. Are we able in Europe to to work with it? 
Yeah, um, almost everywhere. There's that you can get. I, I saw a, a store just around the corner from here yesterday that had a, a Jamaican supply and an African supply. So these are just kind of fairly generic tropical products. But I want to say also that cookbooks are not just to cook from. They're they're you know a recipe or a dish is a whole learning about the culture and the heritage and the um, history and the farming and the traditions of a, of a place. And so, uh, you know, I didn't process which recipes I'd put in this book because I wanted people to bring me what they thought was valuable from their culture. I wasn't trying to put into a format that was an entertainment format. Um, I was really trying to say to the world, look, there's this amazing cuisine out there and no one knew it was out there. And th there was kind of a cultural culinary lack of self-esteem in the Pacific. We, the Pacific Islands have had heavy tourism and th there's been the sense that their food was not good enough for the tourism um, menus. And as I said earlier, that's had, had a terrifically negative impact. But, what, you know, I realized that when, when a group of people tells another group of people their food is no good, it's painful and it has, it has a, 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 it's like cultural pain. So, yeah, I was not looking to create a book that was necessarily a commercial you know the com commercial food product but really a cultural story and you know when all through my book it's people with their food and I, I wanted to capture their story and their take and their you know nostalgia and their memories of these dishes and it, w it was actually an amazing experience it was a two-year process I mean I had no clue when I began <laughs> it would take that long I don't know if I would have done it but um, of course I would have done it because it's it's just been the reaction in the Pacific Islands to this story that has been very emotional and very um, a lot of pride and and it's it's gone into a whole it's it's a most unusual I think um, genre for a chef to be in I don't know if I anticipated that but I've I now I'm working in, in in an area where the cuisine is the kind of the point of development for the nation. Um, did you stop your other career, you do a lot of things. You are not only uh, author and writer. Yes. Uh, do you have to stop your, your yeah, no, it career was for that? completely insane. I don't. You know, I, I, I had a successful catering uh, consultant company in the Caribbean. I was based in Miami and New York at the time. I had a restaurant in Miami, and I, I left it all. But I honestly, it sounds so silly, but I felt this calling. I mean, I, I was born. I was raised in the Pacific Islands. I'm, I'm, I'm from Fiji and Samoa, so I have tremendous loyalty to the nation. And I was, I was literally begged to, to, to come do this book. And once I got on the path, it just felt beautiful. And it felt like, you know, this, this was a project of a lifetime. And, and so I, I stayed with it rather foolishly. I, I was a tremendous cost to myself in the real world, but, you know, that didn't matter at the time. I, I think a lot of authors have stories like that. You know, you, the, the first big book you do is a tremendous risk, and it's a, it's a, it's a risk for the publishers even. So uh, it's, uh, There is more to come. I, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I'm, wor I'm working on two other books right now that are country books. And because I'm working in, a, in an area where um, the cuisine has not really been lifted terribly um, in the literature before, there's tremendous possibility for destination tourism to be shaped with it, for trade. It's, you know, the, the negative kind of attitude towards Pacific cuisine affected Pacific trade as well as tourism. So I'm working in the space to kind of flip the perception and raise the profile of um, the Pacific food story. Mm. And it's, tr it's tremendously relevant to New Zealand because we have a, a 300,000 um, uh, Pacific Islanders living in New Zealand. They're kind of a vital part of our New Zealand cultural landscape. I, I call them our laughter because the, there's a great Pacific Island people laugh loud and you'll, you'll you know that's the first thing you notice if you get off the plane in Fiji or Samoa people will be screaming laughing and it's just this great sense of celebration that us New Zealanders are a little more subdued so it's it's a nice element in, a, in our in our demographic Peter um, I told it in the in our first round that you uh, do a lot of traveling. How many restaurants are under your control by now? It's a tremendous amount. There's a few. There, uh, well, we have two in New Zealand, two in London, two in Istanbul, and uh, the, the affiliation with New York is is just friendly now. That we help set that up, raise the funding, but that's there's very little input apart from the old recipes that still stay on there. Okay. Yeah. 
And uh, what are your next projects? Is it even more restaurants or more cooking books? I think this uh, we have here is number eight. It's number eight, yeah. Uh, well, I, the thing is I love, I really enjoy writing because as a chef in a restaurant, you're part of a chaotic team that every lunch and every, you know, at midday every day and at six o'clock every night, there's this pressure, this thing that just kicks in that's kind of slightly crazy. And then you're under stress and then you have a few issues that go on during the night generally with people with an allergy or something goes wrong. And the great thing about writing is that you're just at home with your radio on Classic FM and you've got cups of tea and there's no one there to annoy you and you don't have to worry that the fish hasn't turned up. So I, I, as, the, <laughs> as the two things, I quite like it. But also, um, because my restaurants are on opposite sides of the world, it's a bit like the theme of while you were sleeping here. You know, I, I wake up in, in London where I live um, for 23 years and in the morning there's, you know, 30 emails from New Zealand to, to deal with and then you go off to work and you deal with your London businesses and then you, um, I mean, it's a, it's a hard slog, you know, and chefing is hard and writing is hard because uh, if no one buys your book then no one wants another book from you. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I find the, the writing quite fun and in New Zealand when I was a kid we did something called school certificate when you were 15 or 16 and for school certificate I got 50% for English. I mean, I just passed in English. So now when I go back to my school, I was there recently and I go back to my primary school and my high school and give talks and teach people how to make soup. And uh, and I and the the school loved the fact that someone who almost failed has you know published now eight books. So they you know there's something quite rewarding and you know I quite do that all the time when I go home. Yeah. Hmm. Al, what did you do before writing start writing books? Well, I found school C first up, so <laughs> so there's definitely a theme here. We're good at making gravy, but maybe not not so good on the uh, intellectual. Sorry, what was that, Martin? Um, um, you have to. You have. When, when did you? When did you publish your first book, Go Fish? Uh, Go Fish must have been about four years ago. Yeah, um, and I followed, uh, and that went very, very well for me. Um, again, uh, a little bit like what Robert's saying, or all of us, I guess, is. Um, I think uh, recipes are very, very important, but other stories are equally important, and and certainly, um, I mean, Annabelle's on the international stage probably more than any of us as an author, but for us uh, in New Zealand, four million people, um, I want everyone to pick up the book, whether they be a cook or, or they want to look at pictures or they want to read a story. Um, and so I think um, that's a big part for me. It's a, a cookbook is sort of has to encapsulate um, a, lot of, a lot of other things, a lot of stories and a lot of connection. Um, and, and like Pete, <clears throat> I, I enjoy the process of writing. It doesn't come naturally, particularly naturally, but it does come eventually. And, um, and uh, yeah, as, a, as we all know, um, there's a lovely sense of achievement when you, when you get your book back. And if you're happy with it, you get very close to them. And, and um, it's, uh, it's, you never ever have that wonderful feeling of opening them for the first time because you've, you know, you've been working on them for a long, long time. But... Um, But in the end, um, you know, they're, they're a great thing. And you, I think you, you, when, they, when you finish them, <clears throat> you say, right, that's it, no more books. Um, and then it's just a, a matter of time before it, suddenly that little <clears throat> devil is on your shoulder again saying time for another one. So, Al, I think, uh, I don't know if I'm on. Um, I think, Al, if you've never had a baby, making a book is like having a baby. It's a bloke's chance to have a baby. <laughs> Because it just gets bigger and bigger, and you think, oh, my God, I want this thing to be over, and then it just goes on and on, it gets harder and harder, and you think, why did I ever think this was a good idea? <laughs> and then it comes out, and it's like, oh, my gosh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> and, and as you said, you think, I'm never going to do that again, and then it comes along, and you go, oh. <laughs> Time for some more children. Yeah. <laughs> Well, travelling uh, New Zealand from the southern part or from the southern area to the northern area, how long would that take? From one end to the other? Walking by a car. No, no, flying, flying. Just to get an oh, idea. Flying. Uh, just to get an idea how... Um, two and a half hours? Two and three, a half three, hours, three. this means uh, 2,500 North kilometers. North You're asking yeah. us hard questions here. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Auckland to Queenstown is an hour and a half, hour 40. So then you add another probably hour on, don't you? Yeah, you two, two and a half hours from tip to tip, something like that, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just, sorry, Robert. I think the point is you, you wouldn't fly. 
if you were looking to explore New Zealand, it's a driving country. I mean, it's just a, obviously, you know, we're part of what has affected us all as New Zealanders is the landscape. You, you cannot, I was born in Taranaki and there's this tremendous mountain there and you look at it every single day and it shapes your personal narrative. It becomes your personal narrative. You, you carry that with you all your life. And that, that, I'm sure everyone in this room has a similar point of reference. But for us as New Zealanders, we have not many people on a lot of land and we've become very c connected to the land. It's also part of our heritage because Māori um, thinking was la people of the land. And we're, we're probably all of us a couple of generations away from having family who were farmers. So we have this relationship with the land that's not just wistful looking at pretty pictures. It's, it's right within our hearts. And this is where I think the, the cuisine ends up coming from. And there is a kind of a purity to that land, food, people. So, you know, one of the reasons New Zealand is so well known for clean food is because we will not do anything to hurt our land. Uh, you know, destination tourism is one thing, but um, that, that, that destination is, is the environment and it's what produces our food. We all, we, we've all expressed that through our books. Um, and that, that is core to who we are. I actually don't agree that there's no New Zealand cuisine. I think there is a New Zealand cuisine that is la like a product of the land. Um, I have, uh, I got information that there are, uh, be, the reason I'm asking why, what is the distance and how long do you fly is to give our people an idea how, what distances we are talking about. So imagine in, in Europe traveling 1500 or 2000 kilometers, this means from Stockholm maybe to uh, uh, Rome. And uh, you pass areas with uh, different languages and different cultures. We have mountains between and, and, and seaside and whatsoever. So the, the kitchen is completely different. So I told it in the lead in that there is no New Zealand kitchen. There are, but there are three or four ethnic um, roots which can, which meet in, in New Zealand. So maybe we can. You can tell us something about that. I, I don't see um, this, uh, our dimensionality as being separate communities. I, we're, we're very small and hyper-connected. So a, a lot of us, you know, it, it, there'll be many types of people at one table. Uh, we're not big enough to have that community or that community. We're very mixed up. Don't you agree? Even in my friendship base, I've got, you know, it, it's it's... It's not separated, so the cuisine doesn't easily separate. It does become New Zealand cuisine. Um, do you think I've got that right, Al? I'm looking to you. <clears throat> no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should no, never have asked I, you. I'm, I'm just, of course you got it right. Um, you know, I, I think a little bit of what Martin is doing too is um, is trying to paint a picture, I think, um, of, of, of the length of the country and the thing that I, I immediately think of when I think of the length of the country and... Um, from top to bo bottom is um, that it's it's a it's a country that's um, um, got very very distinct provinces um, and it's subtropical in the far north to to you know f fairly cold uh, in the in the deep south and and each province really has its own um, has its own feeling has its own vibe has its own um, uh, I guess uh, climate to a certain extent and and you know they're they're all they're all wonderful environments, and they all offer up something completely different. Um, and the diversity there, I think, that's one thing that we, we certainly we have we have four seasons, um, but we have this um, very very diverse uh, um, climates. Cli well, diverse the climates uh, is you know we have four real seasons, so so that's wonderful for growing, and, and and obviously produces wonderful product. And and we celebrate our seasons. We celebrate when the asparagus come. We celebrate when we can forage for mushrooms, and we celebrate when the, when we're allowed to take scallops, etc. So, um, but I, I think that's one of the you know the things that when people do come to New Zealand, they do experience uh, not not just the country, but the the country through its food, is that they will find. Um, an incredibly diverse experience because it just keeps changing from, you know, we talked about, uh, Robert talked about driving in a car. It's a great place to drive. Um, well, it's actually bloody dangerous, but it's, um, <laughs> but it's a great, the, the roads are beautiful and, and, um, and you're just from hour to hour, you'll, be cha you'll have a changing landscape and with that comes a different feel and, a, and, and different food and products.
You know, and I, the other thing I think that's so thrilling is that we have become a really foodie culture. So you can go to some tiny little town and they will have fabulous coffee. And often after they've got fabulous coffee, they'll have a decent wine list and they'll have some interesting food around it as well. So, you know, you could have gone to New Zealand probably 20 years ago and you would smell a deep fat fryer from the northern tip of Kaitaia down to the southern, you know, mm. southern bluff. And that was, you know, it was terrible because there was sort of a, a bit of a culinary desert outside the main restaurant centres. And now I think it's kind of thrilling because people have, are embracing everywhere around the country this idea of their kitchen, you know, and, and feeling bringing whatever products they have to the table. I, I think also what happens in New Zealand, when I, I left in 81 and moved to Australia um, and did an apprenticeship there, I was at uni doing hort science. I wanted to be a winemaker at one point, but we only drank out of casks, and it was called Blenheimer. It was terrible stuff. <laughs> and it was pre-Cloudy Bay, which is, in a way, when the wine revolution kicked off in New Zealand. But, but before I went to Australia, I'd never seen an avocado. I know they grew up north, but they didn't come down to Wanganui. Uh, nothing came to Wanganui. We, uh, we also, I, I had seen a, some olive oil in a drum that a cousin had bought back from Greece that she eked out over sort of five, six years. And I thought, wow, olive oil, I thought you put it in your ears, which is what we did in Wanganui. But also, I'd, I'd never seen a cappuccino. It's so much stuff we didn't have. And now you go home, and I remember in New Zealand uh, when we did the Sugar Club restaurant back in the mid 80s and getting some saffron. I said, like, oh my God, we've got saffron here. This is very, very cool. And now New Zealand grows saffron. We're looking at truffles. Um, they're, they're just farming everything. And New Zealanders produce olive oil, uh, which is great. But the other thing that's really interesting, and perhaps it's missing from here, and Robert touched on it back in the green room, is Maori food culture. Uh, and Maori, obviously, were the first settlers in New Zealand. And the, the, what's really interesting, for a couple of years, I did a, a matariki hangi, which is the traditional Maori way of cooking in the ground. And we fed 700 people each time. Uh, and what, what was fun for that was hangi is a lovely way of cooking but everything does taste the same it comes out of the ground it's slightly smoky very moist um and very much the same so we did a hangi and, and i used a lot of imported and indigenous herbs like horopito and kawakawa and then we um we braised wagyu beef and miso and ginger and we did all sorts of but we cooked it in a hangi and the guys who lay the hangi down which is the traditional way were like oh mate Bro, this is going to be terrible. You know, it's all going to taste the same. We threw sacks of garlic, a whole lot of rosemary into the thing, and the hangi came out quite different. And and then the second time we did it, we, we refined it even more. So uh, next year, or early the end of this year, I'll be going around different Mariah in New Zealand filming a show, learning the local food from different iwi. So there's a, a, some people up on the East Coast that ferment corn in, in the river, which I can't even begin to understand how dreadful that'll be. It'll be like the musical Cheese here, won't it, probably? Yeah. 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 But so, th so there is, a, there is a, a style of food that we've had in New Zealand, but I think contemporary food, contemporary New Zealand cuisine, in a way, is all, a lot of young chefs who've gone offshore, a lot of customers who've gone offshore and come back and demand. You know, so we produce lovely pasta. We have a whole Italian scene. There's a whole Spanish scene going on. There's, you know, we've got a lot of migrants into New Zealand who are producing um, Serbian uh, meat products and, and, and through people like Al, actually, who's set up Depot in Auckland. And it's, uh, it's looking at great New Zealand produce done very simply. But Al is the only chef I know who can put... Um, uh, the throat of harpuka, which normally you throw away, but Al puts it on his menu and sells it for about 20 bucks or something, and it's awesome, you know. Al is showing how to do nose-to-tail eating in New Zealand, which is something that farmers have done, but I think a lot of the public are unaware of it, really. Good marketing, too, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think there's a... It's, it's interesting, there's a... I think we're um, becoming very... a lot more comfortable in our skin as a... As a, um, as a, as a as a, as a food offering, I guess um, Annabelle touched on it. You know, 40 years ago we were a culinary wasteland, and now you know it's quite extraordinary what what we have understood that we can grow and, and we do grow and and um, and we can produce. And and that's that's something that that um, that's you know the learning curve for our country has been quite extraordinary. Um, another thing that I think that we 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 sort of celebrate through as authors or um, or, or chefs in the country is that. Um, 
the importance of um, of taking time of, of growing vegetables or of um, lighting a fire or or, or celebrating a hangi or um, uh, you know there's a lot of what Robert does in the islands as well. But it's it's about slowing down. Um, and slowing down means more time for communication, more time for chatter, more time around a table, more wine, more arguments, more fun. Um, and I think, you know, I think we, uh, uh, certainly for me personally, the, the whole, and I love Jamie, but, you know, 15-minute meals and speed and, 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 and getting things done very, very quickly is not what I'm into so much, even though I'm very busy all the time. But that importance to actually slow down, grow, um, or spend time, you know, hungry. Um, it, it'll take the the whole day, and 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 to be able to be on a marae and to to be part of the preparation, to to stand around the fire, to wait for the for the rocks to heat up, and then to bury it, and then another three hours standing there. Um, for me, that's that's a very very important thing. The food really is the vehicle for for for, for fun and 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 conversation, and I um, I certainly celebrate that. Well, in your cooking book, I remember there was something, keep it simple, use pepper, salt, vinegar, and surround you with people you love, because if you don't love the people, you cannot do a good cooking for them. <laughs> Very close, Martin. <laughs> it, there were, there yeah, were, don't take yourself too seriously. Surround yourself with, with enthusiastic people. Um, Salt and pepper. I mean, we. I think all of us, in a whole lot of ways, um, we celebrate the the product. We're so close to the product that we don't really need to do too much to it. And and to me, it's about cooking products correctly. Um, and you know, the thing is that. I mean, if you're in France and you ordered a plate of scallops, you might get three scallops with a you know some architecture and some dots and some you know some micro greens that look like pubic hair and that sort of thing on the on, on the on the plate if you order the scallops in New Zealand you get a plate of scallops that are cooked in some butter salt and pepper and a wedge of lemon and I know which one I'd like you know so I think we're about generous and about you know connecting you know and 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 not celebrating it not What's, tortured no not tortured <laughs> not tortured food I have that read as well. Somebody was of you was tortured by by the uh, by the food. It was not. Uh, I think it was you wrote. It. No, I, I wrote a, a, a. I write for Huffington Post, and I wrote something on there to the effect that I actually remember very clearly when I was about six years old, my mother threatening me to take me to a restaurant if I didn't behave. <laughs> <laughs> so that would not work anymore. I, I, I want to just um, expand on something Peter said about Maori food and acknowledge. Charles Royal, who I don't know if Charles is here by any chance. He has been. He has yeah, no, been. He's and in he had a cooking he's with show. Us. He's 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 really the um, the f the hero amongst I think Maori food thinking and um, culinary thinking. And he is uh, he's here in Frankfurt right now. He's got a book here. He did a terrific dinner last night. But he's um, really the guy who's uh, um, keeping that cuisine alive and also energizing it. He's got. He does. If you ever go to New Zealand, look up Charles Royal. I think it's MaoriFood.com or .net or something. And he does these amazing food tours um, that take you back. You know, they're very laid back. You meet Charles, get in his car, go into the bush, and he t takes you foraging. And and the very the the really old Maori cookery, he's keeping that alive. So I just you know want to acknowledge him in this room as an impo a very important person in the New Zealand. Uh, Kuni landscape. Okay, um, we have that. We have the Maori influence in in your kitchen. Which other influences are important uh, in New Zealand? You know, I think one of the things that's really defining for us is that <clears throat> every one of us, I'm sure, here did this thing called the Big OE. And so, because for so many years we were cut off from the rest of the world, and we, you know, it's about 26, 28 hours to get here on a plane. Um, we, when you leave school, you just put a backpack on your back, you've got no money, and you head off for two or three or five years. And it was sort of a rite of passage for New Zealanders, especially of my generation. These days, a lot of kids can't afford to do it for as long. But it meant that you were exposed to cuisines from all over the world. And you came home and you had eaten, you know, Mexican burritos and, you know, Peruvian potatoes and 
Indian curries and Malaysian laksas and and so you were really open to these other flavours and you weren't entrenched in coming back and thinking, which is one of the things that you alluded to in a way, that if you took the length of our country and laid it across Europe, you'd run from Sweden down to, you know, southern, uh, southern or well, mid-Italy. Um, and, and each of those would have their own particular culinary cultures that you wouldn't really move outside of. I think that having this travel has really brought a huge change to the way that that we cook but also I think one of the fabulous things is that for such a long time that that distance was a a disadvantage and now it's such an advantage because you can live there and have the sense of connection and yet because of the way that the world is so connected you can share these ideas that that have relevance I think to other people and coming back to what Al was saying in fact we've all been saying really in a way I mean the thing that's um, part of our culinary culture and I probably differ because I'm I am a home cook, I'm a busy working mum so I'm looking for something to happen really fast but we've always lived life around the table you know we have a history of hospitality and again that comes back to us being cut off from the rest of the world so you had people for dinner and you can come to New Zealand and they might be complete strangers that, they meet, that you'll meet and they'll say come for lunch, and they're not going to be axe murderers, you know. <laughs> they're actually going to genuinely want to share their table and, and, their, and their life with you. And I think that that's what we celebrate as a country, that, you know, we, lo- we love sharing food together and we love bringing new people into the conversation. We love sharing ideas, and it's a real forum for fresh thinking, actually, the table. I just want to say one thing that I noticed, because I've, I've lived most of my life out of New Zealand, is that I've, you know, you get, like Annabelle said, with, with the overseas experience, you get this great um, insight at, at, from being an onlooker of your own, uh, your own culture in a way. And one thing that I do love about New Zealand, I do a lot of work for, for the New Zealand government in China around food, is that because we're not big and we've been disconnected, we haven't developed big industrial kind of clunky not very good food systems. We stayed quite small and artisanal. Even our biggest farm systems are tiny compared to most of the rest of the world. And so that, that, what that has mean is, is that the New Zealand farming community and food producers have maintained that land connection and respect. And I, I think that's why our food safety record is so good globally. So that, that, that we all carry that with us as well. Well, uh, working with you together always leaves a uh, kind of... Uh, Uh, a feeling you you're talking to pioneers or you work with pioneers there is no then there cannot come up something which you cannot handle because it's maybe because the country is so big and it's so few people it's, it's four million i think spread over whole europe imagine that and uh, you has you have to help yourself and maybe this is the the different feeling um this um pioneer thing that uh, That you go, that you go, that you take your backpack and go out in the forest and go to live there for three or four days and then return. You cannot do that in in, uh, in Europe, nowhere. I remember at the press conference of the book fair eight or nine weeks ago, we everybody met at your place. I think is it correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and there you got that feeling. You're all one family. There yeah, were all yeah, well, that, yeah, that's I guess it, it, that sort of um, backs up what Annabelle was saying. But that was um, they asked me to put on a, um, a a do that we were going to video, you know, a barbecue, which is which is dear to our heart hearts as New Zealanders. Um, and so, you know, I was having I think about a dozen authors over from right up and down the country, and um, and that was extraordinary. And and um, but uh, you know, for for these wonderful people to be coming to my home, and so obviously, you know, I cooked some seafood and and opened some oysters and did some bits and pieces and um, over some fire, of course. And um, but I didn't know any of these authors personally. But I mean, I think it gets back to that that food is the vehicle for um, bringing people together, and and it sort of breaks down. Um, uh, I guess it breaks down formality, and you know we're 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 very generous with our hospitality. We love we love entertaining. We love uh, there's a real sense of pride, and 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 you don't have to know people to 
you know, I, I simply en- enjoy that um, that lovely feeling of of seeing people relax and seeing people understand that and um, that they're in a that they're in a great environment. And and that showed, I think, in that video that they shot of uh, um, a few months ago. And again, it was a situation where within an hour it felt like we were all good friends and we were and that was because of of food and wine and stories and 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 people and this is what the feeling uh, we got after seeing this film so what are your your next projects maybe uh, this is um, uh, interesting to know We talked already about books. Uh, by the way, uh, is it necessary to leave your country to say um, we uh, to 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 have the to 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 have um, the, the 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 idea of how good the ingredients are and how good life could be? This we have in in all. Um, The, the Western countries, we have this situation that everybody ha- everybody rushes, everybody runs. Uh, you have to make uh, dates for everything and uh, uh, even not allowed to, to, to say hello to everybody without a lawyer standing next to you. And you guys, we are, well, I, tomorrow is good enough and uh, we will find a way and, and that works. Do you have to leave the country to, to, to enjoy this again? Did you ever leave the country for a longer period? Um, I, I, I certainly, I, yeah, I traveled um, for about four or five years. I did, did the OE thing. Um, and and it's, as Annabelle said, you know, and we, we brought everything back. And, and, you know, and it reminds me, uh, someone asked me recently, uh, I, I was being interviewed by, by a couple of German journalists six months ago about coming over here. And I thought it was a really great question. They asked me... Um, so this is what you guys do, this is what you cook, but what about just everyday New Zealanders? How is their cooking these days? And again, right from this sort of culinary wasteland of 40 years ago, I thought it was a good question. I thought, well, I thought, I thought two things. One, um, I thought, well, what, what, would, what would we not have cooked back then um, that we could cook well now? And one is, one is salmon. Most New Zealanders, all New Zealanders now, probably can cook salmon quite well. Another one, the other thing that I was thinking of was that one of Peter's dishes. He had an amazing, amazing restaurant um, that is still very um, talked about a lot, still in, in the history of New Zealand, called the Sugar Club. And um, he had a steak with pesto on it, and that was a that was an exotic sauce, was it not, Pete? Then, but most New Zealanders now could make pesto. And um, I think that's quite, you know, and, and, and that's what Annabelle celebrates and, and um, all those, you know, and, and so that just even as, as we as, as chefs are, are understanding and, and cooking a lot more, um, certainly the middle of the country or the, the whole country seems to be swept along and they are taking a lot more pride, I guess, and understanding that um, and getting away from meat and three veg and, and that's what we were. Um, you know, 40 years ago, and, and now we can grow. And now, but now when we go and gather abalone um, or pawa, is, is how we call them, the Maori name, um, they'll think of a whole lot of different ways to do with it. So it's not just a fritter, which is still a lovely thing, but um, there's certainly. Do you, do you agree with that, Pete? Do you think it's that. that yeah, uh, I, th- I think people's maturity in the kitchen and confidence is good, and New Zealand has. I think proportionally we have seemed to have one of the highest percentages of food magazines per head of capita or something. Is that correct? I keep getting told that, so I assume it's got to be Let's true. Let's go with that. It's got to be true. But, but there's so much um, food discussion, and, and I guess there's all that food TV around, a lot of which is terrible. Um, but there's some brilliant shows. And, uh, <laughs> nice comeback. Yeah. And, uh, but, well, there's, just a, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't speak to New Zealanders, I think. And the, the TV in New Zealand that works really well is, I think, a combination of outdoorsy information, uh, foresight, passed on, simple to do things. And I think, um, actually, for both of your shows, when you see yourself cooking often in a the back of a truck or something, you know, and producing a meal, I think that puts confidence in the, in the consumer and the viewer, really. Yeah. Okay then, uh, one last round with uh, with your latest projects or with uh, what uh, we can expect from the future, Annabel. What is uh, what's going on now? 
Um, I feel very lucky. I work with a company called Fremantle Media, and so our first show's gone to 83 countries around the world, and my next show's doing the same thing, and we're going to keep on showing people how simple it is to cook really fresh, easy food when you start with a great ingredient. Okay, is, uh, is it possible for Europeans, for Germans, uh, uh, to see something in the internet? Absolutely. Um, I have a website, which is AnnabelleLangbein.com, and I have some little clips up there, little video clips. Um, and, uh, yeah, quite a lot. I'm really interested in... I always think if, you, if people know how to cook, it's such an easy way to have a good life. So that's kind of what I'm about, is making that as, that, that as easy for people to get from that ingredient to something yummy on the table without sort of feeling that they have to be stressed out or get a whole lot of ingredients and, and actually um, that it's not hard work, that it can be fun. It's not like performance food of chef stuff. You, your kids can be doing their homework and you can be having a glass of wine and, and as long as you know that one really important thing, as Al said, you need to know how to cook that piece of fish or chicken or roast that pumpkin or whatever it is, then you can really play. It takes a lot of the stress out. So it's like the, the idea of the New Zealand people, we will manage a way somehow. Okay. And have fun. And have fun. <laughs> um, I'm opening a restaurant in Auckland next year called Kai Pacifica, which is based on the cuisines of the different Pacific Islands. Um, that's March, April. I'm doing a book uh, in Samoa right now. Samoa's um, uh, one of the wonderful countries in the South Pacific Islands and it was actually a German colony uh, way back. So there's a There's a great romance from the Samoan mind towards Germany and vice versa. Um, I work with a woman's group there. We're um, working on a project that, to make the whole country organic. Um, it's an amazing group of grandmothers who, got, who wanted their children to have fresh food. So they've been, they've been as commercial agriculture came in, they've been certifying their, all their home farms organic, which means keeping it the same in the old Polynesian farming technique. So it's maintaining that purity, capturing and maintaining the purity. So I'm working on, actually working on a project with them across the whole Pacific region. Um, my last book has been made into a TV series early next year also that I'll be, I'll be hosting. So that's my uh, – and another book as well after that. Okay. Uh, one thing uh, is allergy or um, um, vegan food and vegetarian food a big thing in New Zealand by now? I, I'll speak for the Pacific Islands. Um, the original food – Uh, diet of the Pacific Islands was quite heavily ve vegetable. What's happened in the Pacific Islands has been a lot of fast food come in. It's a lot of the old dishes are being lost and he he hence a lot of health-related problems. And that's one of my roles is to kind of um, create excitement around the old dishes again and also, you know, just present new ways and catalyze the cuisine process in getting people to eat from the land again. So there is a large vegetarian component to what I'm doing. Okay, thank you. Peter, uh, maybe a restaurant in Germany? Uh, probably not, I don't think. <laughs> I don't know. We, uh, we've had some lovely food. We, had a, we went out to a um, meat restaurant the other night, didn't we? God, it yeah, was a lot of meat. Amazing. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. just Meatsville, Arizona. And we had uh, the musical Cheese, which I've had a few times here. But, uh, but well, I'm we're working on a couple of restaurants in New Zealand and uh, also in London which will be good. I write the odd piece for the Financial Times, and I find myself always, I always hark back to my 50% school certificate mark and think, I've, you know, I write for the Financial Times. This is quite flash. Um, and then there's always, you know, sort of recipe writing. I have a weekly column in the Herald back home and, and stuff back in New Zealand, back home. Um, so I'll, I'll just keep flitting between both countries and doing some fun stuff in, in other places. And, yeah, I, I think it's a great life actually and I, I look back at my ancestry which is Maori and Scottish and think you know the cuisines from both ancestors wasn't great uh, it was basic you know very very basic porridge or kumara and um, and I kind of and I, so I just kind of keep feeling that I'm part of this you know whole generation that we're all part of uh, moving forward and you know and just hel helping to promote the food in New Zealand really okay thank you L um I'm hoping to go fishing sometime soon. Um, I've got a couple of a uh, couple of new. Um, I've got a rest, another restaurant, and another um, hospitality offering opening up early next year. Uh, I've got a new book coming out in a month's time. We're launching uh, called Get Fresh, um, and I've got a few products that I'm developing and on another TV show starting and filming in Australia in December. So, um, will this be available in the internet? 
or spots of it. Yeah, uh, of it. yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm sure that will all be um, part of the whole the whole deal. But um, it's uh, I think I mean you see you talk to all, all four of us and and it's probably the same as everyone. Um, out here, we're all very busy these days. Our lives are quite extraordinary, and and um, and if you enjoy what you do, it's 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 a fun ride. And I'm like, well, all of us, I think, up here, um, you know, we're enjoying. A, I think we're very fortunate too to 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 call New Zealand home and to and to have been on this journey that that started and that's not bound by tradition. Um, so it's open for interpretation and. Um, and it's, uh, I don't know, it's a small community and um, we're all very proud of New Zealand. We, we love promoting it through, through food and wine and people. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as far as I understood, there will be no uh, New Zealand restaurant the next year, uh, within the next years. But I'm looking forward to get more translated uh, books we have already. I'm looking forward uh, to get more of that Kiwi feeling in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.